Good morning. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here this morning. So welcome to Bible Baptist Church, Senior Saints, here at the end of January. So believe it or not, the weather is good. It's just January cold, and it's not raining until this afternoon, but that don't matter. We'll be taking a nap anyway. So we're going to sing number 113, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, and we'll sing all four verses. Number 113, on the first verse. Savior, like the shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. With our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, Blessed Jesus, Thou hast brought us Thine we are. Blessed Jesus, Blessed Jesus, Thou hast brought us Thine we are. Just found out we don't have any special music, so if anybody wants to sing today, they're welcome. And John and Patty aren't here, so. How do you know when you reach middle age? You ever wonder about that? You know, we're supposed to resist temptation, but middle age is when you have a choice of two temptations and you always pick the one that will get you home before 9 o'clock. <laughs> That's when you know you're middle-aged. 
A lot of you like facts. You like trivia. Let me give you a fact today. The average person walks 913 miles every year. That's the average, 913 miles. The average person drinks 556 glasses of juice every year. So they walk 913 miles, they drink 556 glasses of juice. And that amounts to 27.8 gallons of juice a year. Now you think about that, that's 33 miles to the gallon. That ain't all bad. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Connie was telling me that, that Bruce made a New Year's resolution this year. You know, we all make our New Year's resolutions, and by the 10th of the month, they're all gone. But Bruce is going to keep his. His New Year's resolution is he will not take a Tesla electric vehicle to Target to pick up Bud Light this year. <laughs> He's not going to do it. We have a deacon here called Workin. We have Workin Deacon and we have a Shirkin Deacon. But Workin was out in his 78 Mercury dog sled. He was sailing down through Happy Dale, doing about 45 miles an hour, just enjoying the, the good weather and everything like that for January. And he noticed some movement out of, picked it out of his left eye, some movement. And he turned around and looked out his window there. And there's a chicken. Now he's doing 45 and this chicken is picking them up and putting them down right alongside him. And he said, my goodness, look at that. He, so he picks up speed a little bit and he's sailing up about 60 miles an hour and the chicken passed him. And he looks out and he said, that chicken's got three legs. I'm looking at it, it's got three legs. I never seen a three-legged chicken. And lo and behold, this chicken takes a left turn and zips up in the mare's barnyard in the Happy Dale. Well, working decides he'll follow that chicken and see where it's going, so he makes a left turn and he's up in the mare's barnyard and the mare's out there drinking a cup of coffee, just looking over her domain, you know, and work and pulls up alongside, rolls down the winter, and he said, you see a chicken go past here? She said, yep, I did. He says, did that chicken have three legs? Yep, it did. Never seen a three-legged chicken. Yep, I raised them here. You raised three-legged chickens? And the mayor said, yep, we raise them here, right here on the farm. How come you're raising three-legged chickens? Never seen one before. Well, it's this way. I like drumsticks. <laughs> and Bernie likes drumsticks. And that was just fine. But then along comes Amy. And Amy likes drumsticks. So every time we sit down to a chicken dinner, it's fight, fight, fight over the drumstick. Who gets the drumsticks? So I decided I'm going to breed me some three-legged chickens. And Workin says, well, that's fantastic. He says, how do they taste? She says, I don't know. We haven't caught one yet. <laughs> Pastor Braden is out in his truck one day and he gets pulled over by the local gentry. The red lights go on and they pull him over to the side. 
policeman walks up to the window and rolls down the window and he says, you know, you got two tail lights that are out. I do. Yes, you got two tail lights are out. So Pastor Braden opens the door and he gets up and he walks back to the back of the truck and just starts crying like a baby and howling and wailing. And the policeman says, you don't need to cry about it. It's just two tail lights. And Pastor Braden says, they're gone. They're gone. He says, it's not a big deal. You're not going to get a ticket. He says, it ain't the tail lights. He says, I'm missing a travel trailer, a wife and six kids. <laughs> We're going to be in 1 Corinthians, and this is your New Year's message. We're a little late, but it's still the new year, I think. I think we got 11 months to go. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes a letter of correction to a church full of people that he loves. This was probably a very difficult letter for Paul to write, dictated by the Holy Spirit. He put it down, but they had to be corrected if they were going to do what they needed to get done in the Lord's work. If they were going to accomplish anything in the Lord's work, they had to do it the Lord's way. They were Paul's children. And I know as a father, I had a very difficult time collect, correcting my children, but I knew that I had to correct my children or they wouldn't grow up the right way. And every parent has this responsibility, and I think every parent probably has a lot of difficulty correcting their own children. Paul had the same problem with his children. And our children have to be corrected, both physical 
and spiritual. <coughs> they have to be put on the proper path and in order to, for them to do what they need to do in the Lord's work, they have to stay on that path. We know around here that when our pastor preaches through the Bible, when he gets to a place where the Bible is correcting, he has to correct his children. And you and I all know that our pastor loves his children. He certainly does. 32 years he spent, and we are his children. God has put him as our overseer, as our under shepherd, and oft times we need to be corrected to stay on the right path. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul covers many topics. He denounces the wrong and he tells them how to get right. He entrusts them, he instructs them on how to properly use the gifts that God has blessed us, blessed them with. As our pastor instructs us on how to use the gifts that God has entrusted us with. We all have gifts. We need to use them properly. The Apostle Paul teaches his children in chapter 13 that charity is love in action. It's not an emotion, but it's love in action with the proper motives. Not just an emotion, not just a warm feeling. Chapter 13, he also says that they are to put away childish things. In other words, grow up. We have in our church adult Christians. We have in our church growing Christians. And we have in our church baby Christians. It's always going to be that way if the church is doing what it's supposed to be. But we all, as Christians, need to grow up. There's a world out there to be one. Chapter 15, he talks about the blessed hope, the resurrection chapter of the Bible. All of this because this life doesn't end at all. We have a an aide in our church, her grandmother passed away this week. Her grandmother was in there. They brought her in there about a month ago knowing that she was on a downhill run. And I talked to her this morning before we come out here. And I said, you know, you and I both know that life doesn't end with the grave. I asked her, I said, have you ever in your young years thought of something that happened when you were a 10 year old or a 12 year old and maybe a dream in the night that was just as real as real could be and she said oh yeah that happens often and I says that tells you something your soul doesn't die your soul is always alive that soul of a 12-year-old and the soul of the 30-some-year-old and the soul of the 80-year-old are all the same age. That soul lasts through eternity. That body's just the vehicle that our soul lives in. That's the house that we stay in while we're on the earth. And if we didn't have the blessed hope, the resurrection, life wouldn't be worth living. Paul, Paul starts out with chapter 16 with a lesson in giving. He talks about how to give and give properly. If your heart is right with God, your giving will show it. That's always true. A Christian with their heart right in, that's right with God, it will show in their giving. None, we're not just talking about money. We're talking about 
giving of themselves and their time and their talents, all for the service of God. And he, then he finishes out by talking about what lays ahead for his ministry. And in verse 9 of chapter 16, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. And I want to talk to you for a short time this morning on how to be effectual in 2024. We have a great door open for us. We haven't been there before. And that door is 2024. How are we going to be effectual knowing that our adversary, the devil, wants us to fail? Sad to say, but he's trying every way he can to trip us up, to keep us from serving the Lord. But here we are with a new year. And a new year is just like a book with blank pages. And every day of our new year, we fill in a page. And what we put on that page makes the difference between, between having a year that was effectual and a year that wasn't. A new year is a great door, the Bible says. It's huge. It looms large. Its contents, we don't know what they hold. We know what last year held, but we don't know what this year holds. I know as a kid, and you probably have one too, I remember going down to granddad's. And granddad had a four bedroom. All the kids, of course, had long gone and they had one room in there that was a small bedroom. And did you ever have something that you didn't really need, but you didn't really want to throw it away? Well, it went in that room. We referred to it as a junk room. And the door was always shut on that room. We knew what was in there, but we didn't want to look at it every day. And out at our farm, we had a room like that too. We had a junk room. And if you didn't know what to do with it, but you didn't want to throw it away, in that room it went. And that was a door that was hid. Our door we can't hide. 2024, the door is flung open and we see every day as a new door. We have never been through this door before. We don't know what lays on the other side, but we do know one thing. It's a door of opportunity. That door is an opportunity for us. Well, we can make sure that we don't make the same mistakes we made previously. You can look back in 2023, 2022, and so on back, and you say, Boy, I wish I hadn't have done that. That was a boner. That was, I was a bonehead. And we realize that folks are dumb where we come from. We never learn, but we need to learn. Hindsight is 2020. But how come we don't learn much from it? Well, we look back at the years going by and we say, boy, I wish I'd have done that or I wish I'd have done this. Make 2024 the year of I'm glad I did instead of the year of I wish I had. Too many times it becomes the year of I wish I had. Don't make next this year the year of I wish I had. Don't miss the opportunity to be a blessing to somebody. One of the verses that I've held to, to my heart, and I try to live this verse every day, is Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 27. 
you ought to write that down and read it and hide it in your heart. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in within the power of thine hand to do it. Think about that verse. You need to start off your day by reading that verse and meditating on that verse and thinking, what can I do today that I can be a blessing to somebody with? Things that I can, not things that I can't hope to do, but things that are in the power of my hand. And it's in the power of your hand to smile. It's in the power of your hand to have a kind word. But make it something that you can do to make somebody's life worth living. Make it the year of the extra mile. Now, Sonia, that doesn't mean that you miss your exit and you have to go to the next one and come back. The Romans had a rule that any Roman soldier could make any subject carry his burden for one mile. You were required by law, if he said, pick up my load and carry it, that Jewish person would pick up that load with a frown on their face and they would never smile and for one mile they would carry that burden. And to the last step in that mile, if they were in the middle of a mud puddle, it didn't matter. They dropped that load and they went on. They had fulfilled their obligation. But the Christian, when the soldier says, pick up my load, they picked up the load with a smile and they smiled at the soldier and the soldier looked a little funny at him and he says, one mile. And they walked their mile and the mile came to an end and the soldier looked to pick his burden out of the mud puddle, but he didn't because the Christian smiled at the soldier and went on the second mile and smiled all the way. The soldier couldn't get over that. But the Christian was able to witness to that soldier the second mile because he had a smile on his face as he carried that burden. Make 2024 the year of the second mile. Go that extra mile. We need to make 2024 the year when we are effectual. The word effectual means useful, valuable, ending up with a desired effect. Don't just spin your wheels. I'm reminded <laughs> Connie's uncle was our superintendent of schools, Olin C. Lake. Many of you had his wife as a teacher in Byesville School, Evelyn. We fondly called him Dad Lake. Thursday night at school was the board meeting. And Dad Lake drove a 1952 Hudson Hornet. And not only did he drive it, he drove it. <laughs> He had the pedal to the metal and those Hudson would flat out fly. And Dad Lake made that thing fly. Across the street from Madison School was a little grocery store, one pump, gas pump, restaurant, so on, called the Crow's Nest. Right across from Madison School out there in 22. Well, Dad Lake would always park over at the crow's nest and before, after the board meeting was over, he'd get him a cup of coffee and then head back to Byesville. Well, we were seniors in high school and we parked the road over and come across a cornfield and a hay field and a creek and slipped up after dark and slid a jack under Dad Lake's axle and dropped his rear tire in a watermelon rind. Not just any watermelon rind, but a watermelon rind that had set for a few days and was quite slippery. 
And when we let the tire back down and we took our jack and we slipped back across the creek and we stayed there in the willows and we were waiting and watching. Well, Dad Lake comes out bouncing out across the street, goes in, gets his cup of coffee, and he jumps in that Hudson and run, kicks her into gear, and everything is stick shift back then. And he hit the pedal to the metal and run, run. <laughs> And it took him a while before he could grind that watermelon around. <laughs> he got out and looked at that. He never did find out who did it. <laughs> I think he had some suspicions, but we weren't anywhere to be found. So, But I often think of that, and so many times we spin our wheels, too. We don't get much accomplished. But we need to make 2024 a year when we don't just spin our wheels, that we need to be effectual. The word effectual comes from the same root word that we get our word energy. Energy comes from the same root. The word energy means full of power to do work and full of wisdom to use that power wisely. We have the power within us, the Holy Spirit of God, to do the work that we need to do in God's, in God's field. We need to have the wisdom to use that power wisely. And we need to pray every day that God will give us that wisdom. I remember as a kid, I was the oldest boy. And mo many of you remember the dead chestnut trees, the chestnut blight that killed the trees. And there were chestnuts all over, made wonderful fence posts, wonderful. But in order to get a fence post out of them, you had to cut them down. And in order to cut them down, some of those trees were pretty good size. We had a seven foot crosscut saw, and my dad taught me to use that crosscut saw. And he said, now what you do, you know, I'm seven years old, eight years old. He says, you don't push a saw. He says, you pull a saw. He says, I'll pull it my way and you pull it back your way. And I'll pull it my way and you pull it back your way. Don't push it. You can't get any place pushing a saw. Pull it. Let the saw do the work. And that we did. And here's a seven year old and a 30-some-year-old sawing up dead chestnuts and splitting them and making fence posts out of them. But the wisdom to use that power wisely came from pulling it and not pushing it. Our spiritual power comes from the Word of God. All Scripture is given to me by inspiration of God, and that's in 2 Timothy 3. 16 and 17 and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works God teaches us through the word what is right he teaches us what's wrong, and he teaches us how to get it right and how to keep it right. That's all through the Word of God. That's where our spiritual power comes from. We get our power from the Word of God. We talk to God in prayer. God talks to us out of the Word. That's where our power comes from. The third thing, the third part of spiritual power comes from holy living. We need to strive every day to live closer to the Lord than we did yesterday. To be a better Christian today than we were yesterday. We need to make 2024 a year when we recognize and conquer our adversaries. The devil wants us to fail. I can remember as a kid coming home from Sunday school, I just loved to read the Sunday paper. Not the news, 
not the sports, but the funnies. And I used to come in there waiting for Sunday dinner, and I would lay down in the middle of the living room floor and spread those funny papers out in front of me and just soak up every one of them. And one of the, my favorite cartoons was Pogo the Possum. Remember Pogo? Always something going on in the Okeechodoke swamp there. And Pogo was quite a philosopher. And they had a battle in the swamp and they were out there with their helmets and their swords and, and Pogo runs across one of his friends with a helmet and a sword and Pogo looks at him and he says, we has met the enemy and the enemy is us. And boy, isn't that the truth. We have met the enemy and the enemy is us. Most of us have so much problem with the flesh, we have never conquered our own flesh yet that the devil doesn't have to worry a whole lot about us. Our flesh takes care of us. The flesh is one of the adversaries that we have to conquer. And for God to use us, we have to guard against those adversaries that hinder our effectualness and spiritual power. We've gone through a thing here with COVID. Wash your hands. Everybody turn around, wash your hands. You get up, wash your hands. You sit down, wash your hands. Keep clean hands. Well, you and I as Christians have to watch our hands because we can get dirty hands. They tell the story about Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher in England. He smoked cigars, loved his cigars. They didn't know what we know about tobacco back then. But he was walking down the street one day and it passed a tobacco shop. And there's a sign in the window that said Spurgeon's Tobacco's, Spurgeon's Cigars sold here. He took one look at that sign and the Lord convicted him. And he said, I don't want people to know me for my cigars. I want people to know me for my preaching. He never touched another cigar. He had to wash his hands. We have some bad habits that you and I need to get rid of too. One of the things that I see in Christian circles too much is gossip. Now, we don't call it that. You know, the ladies are looking, the new baby comes into church and the ladies look at that little baby and the baby leaves and the ladies say, isn't he just the ugliest little baby you ever seen in your life? Bless his heart. <laughs> and they put that they they put that southern disclaimer on the end of it and that makes it okay. You can say whatever you want about somebody. She's wicked as homemade sin. Bless her heart. <laughs> As long as you put that Southern disclaimer on there, it's not gossip, right? Well, we've got to watch that. Sometimes in our prayer meetings, we have prayer requests that are nothing more than gossip. They can't gossip about somebody. We need to pray for Mrs. Jones. Uh, you know, she's seeing her next door neighbor's husband. Bless her heart. <laughs> and we make prayer requests that are nothing more than gossip. You need to, a lot of things are best left unsaid and undone. One of the things I notice being in assisted living, everybody depends too much on the TV set. I've got a neighbor across the hall I don't know whether his TV ever goes off, but I know in the morning when I get up, the TV's on, and when I go to bed at night, it's on. And the stuff he watches is just like having an open sewer running into the room. It's reality TV. Is this lady's boyfriend the father of her children, or is it somebody else? 
And they said, he said it wasn't. Well, it was. And just a whole bunch of garbage like that. It's like having an open sewer. Why do you keep your TV on? Oh, I like to, the noise. It's just noise. What's well, noise? But if it affects you, it warps your brain, makes a pervert out of you. Watch your TV. Watch and s be careful about what you watch because that stuff will get to you. You may not think you listen to it, but I'll tell you, it gets in your head. Another thing that you and I have to watch out for as we get older, materialism. How much is enough? Anybody here have a collection? Do you collect something? I know I used to have miniature cars, scale cars, loved them. They sat in a case all locked up and gathered dust. And once a year, you take them out and dust them off and you admire them. I didn't play with them anymore. I should have played with them. I should have got down on the floor and go zoom, zoom. But I didn't even do that. So when Jane and I moved back to Guernsey County, I blessed my son with my car collection. I had Hudson's and Mercury's and Studebaker's and Model T's and Model A's. And I loved them cars. But they didn't do me a bit of good. They just sat there and gathered dust. We got back to Cambridge. I made up my mind every time a kid come around, I'd load his car. And you know, some of you ought to do the same thing. The kid comes around, load the car. Here, you take a load of this. This is yours, take it home. This is yours, take it home. And pretty soon you'll get down where your stuff is manageable and you can get around and you don't have to dust it all every day. How much is enough? Laziness, oh boy, I got a nerve there. You know, we are by nature lazy. Did you know that? We have to kickstart ourselves every morning. Lack of work ethic. We're not accountable anymore, we're retired. We're retired, we have less time than we ever had before. We had a phrase growing up that I'll never forget. How many of you are familiar with the uh, term hydromatic? 1948, Oldsmobile came out with the first automatic transmission. You remember those? It was called a hydromatic transmission. The nickname of those transmissions was slushomatic. You had to get them up about 4,000 RPMs before they ever started to move. They took off slow. Well, they used to have a term for somebody in the, they would call them a hydromatic southerner. Do you know what a hydromatic southerner is? That's a shiftless hillbilly. <laughs> and in, when I was growing up, if there was one in the county, everybody knew who it was. They were a hydromatic southerner. Friendships. They can make you or break you. Friendships can be good. Friendships can be bad. Our acquaintances are many, our friends are few. You are fortunate in your life if you can count on one hand five real good friends. We name a lot of people friends that are merely acquaintances. You ask the hillbilly, how do you tell the difference between a friend and an acquaintance? The hillbilly will tell you, you would borrow from, a, um, from an acquaintance, but you'd only loan to a friend. You think about that. That's deeper than you think. They will make you and they will make or break you. 
Another thing we have to guard against is stinginess. I'll tell you what, the older we get, the tighter we get. We get tighter than the bark on a tree, and you got to guard against that. We get to the place where we can, where we, or we get what we can, we can what we get, and we sit on the lid. That's what old age is. We don't give anything away. We don't even give our smile away. But we get stingy with everything. You need to be compassionate. You need to be giving. You can't take it with you. I never saw a Brinks truck in a funeral possession. Never. Now, in an Italian funeral possession, you'll see a cement truck now and then, but, but never a Brinks truck. Compassion, lack of compassion. I'll tell you what, paybacks are wicked. It doesn't take much to give somebody a smile, a kind word when they're going through a trial. Sometimes, if you're not compassionate, God has to take you there. God will make you compassionate. I started my first church in 1976. My mom and dad came up for Charter Member Sunday, July 17th, 1976. Came from Cambridge to Michigan. Wonderful day. Done a lot of things in my life that my mother couldn't be proud of. She could be ashamed of if she ever knew it. But that day she was proud. My dad was proud of me. We had, I think, we started a church in April or May, and we had maybe 30, 35 people when we chartered it. They went back to Cambridge that Sunday afternoon. Monday, I come home from work. I still work at General Motors. So I walked in the house. The phone rang. It was my brother. I've told the story before. Come on home. Mom's dead. My mom had gotten killed in an accident. Mowing the grass, got the power mower tied up, John Deere 18 horse tractor, tied up in a guy wire, tipped over backwards and crushed her chest. You know, I had a piece about me. I knew where my mother was. You don't lose somebody when you know where they're at. My mother was in heaven, but I just had to ask the Lord. And I don't think it's wrong to ask the Lord. Why, Lord? Why, after all these years and all the nasty, mean things that I've done and been, now that I've done something right, you take my mother home? And I had to ask that question. Well, sometimes we never get the answer. But I got mine about two weeks later. I had a 20-month-old child die in the church, and that was my first funeral. That 20-month-old child was a Canadian Indian. Her aunt came to church, brought the little girl and her sisters, and had God not taken my mother home, I would have never had the compassion to deal with the family. Grandpa was a Canadian Indian, a drunkard, 70s. Uncle Charlie, Canadian Indian, drunk all the time. Never darkened the door of a church except for a funeral or a wedding. You couldn't have got them to come to church on a regular day if your soul depended on it. They came to the funeral. Grandpa got saved. Uncle Charlie got saved. Five other people got saved. If God hadn't have taken my mother home to her reward, I wouldn't have had the compassion to deal with that family. Sometimes God has to take you there. Don't be guilty of lack of compassion. And then we got to watch our emphasis. 
Anything that detours you away from the local church is not God's will. Promise keepers, all that stuff like that, that drag you away from the local church, that's not God's will. God works through the local church. God blesses the local church. God blesses the mission programs of local churches. God blesses the local church. Don't let anybody drag you away from it. Everything needs to be centered in the local church. Your giving, your alms, everything like that needs to be out of the local church. The last thing, uncertainty about salvation. And I've told you this before. First thing I did when I got to college is find me a rest home to preach in. And I found Grovecrest Convalescent Center. They needed somebody to do a Sunday service. I, before I even enrolled in Bible college, I had a church or I had a place to preach on Sunday afternoons. They envied me. They always tried to get me to let them preach in my church on Sunday afternoon. No way, boys. Go get, go get your own. I had 66 residents in there, 66 beds when the places were full. Had this lady come to the services, 95 years old, Methodist lady, sweetest lady you ever met in your life. And she used to brag about all the perfect attendance records that she had all those years going to church. But 95 years, nobody ever told her that she had to get saved to get to heaven. And at 95 years of age, she trusted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. You got to be certain about your salvation. If you've never doubted your salvation, something's wrong with you. The devil's not worried about you. The devil will try to make you doubt your salvation. You get the assurance of your salvation out of the Bible. When you do what the Bible tells you to do, and you do it, the Holy Spirit will move into your heart. You're saved. I don't care what the devil says, you're saved. You need to have assurance of your salvation. If you're not, you get before your face with God and do what the Bible tells you to do and God will save you and give you that assurance. This year can this be the most effective year in our lives as far as the work of God if we make it that way. Don't let your flesh stand in the way. Put the devil to work. Don't be a pushover for the devil. 1973, Rose Parade. How many of you watched the Rose Parade? I forgot it this year. I always watch it every year. Standard Oil, 1973, had a float in the Rose Parade. I think they probably do every year. Countless hundreds of hours building that float. And that parade, if I'm not mistaken, is five miles long. 1973 Standard Oil float in the Rose Parade. Halfway through the Rose Parade, the float breaks down. What are you going to do? You bring out the tow vehicle and you hook it up and you tow it the rest of the way through. What's wrong with the Standard Oil float? They get to working it over and they look at it and the thing run out of gas. <laughs> Halfway through the Rose Parade, the Standard Oil float, the biggest gas producer in the United States of America, and their float runs out of gas. Well, keep your tank full of the Word of God in 2024. Don't run out of gas in the middle of the year and God will bless 2024 and he will make you effectual in the work of God. Father, we pray that we can be effectual in your work 
this year. Lord, we don't want to spin our wheels. We want to accomplish something. We want to see souls saved. We want to see missionaries sent. We want to see the church grow. And we above all want to grow ourselves in grace and knowledge of your word. Help us to be students of your word. Help us to be warriors in prayer and help us to live a holy and a just life as best we can. Help us to keep a short list on sin and go to you every morning and start with it that day with a clean slate and confess our sins and forsake our sins and vow never to go back to them as we serve you in 2024. Bless these that have gathered here today and we thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness and we thank you for the new faces we see and the growth in the church and we ask that you bless this year and bless us this year. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.